All right. Uh, uh, oops, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Uh, wait a minute. I, I wanted to record, so I guess okay. I have to go all the way into the into this and then come back. There we go. Right. Okay. So. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so I thought I would begin today by just having a little vignette about virtual knots since they started to get mentioned. Um, this will just be a few minutes. Here are the moves for virtual knot theory. You add uh, combinatorially and diagrammatically, you add a crossing, which is neither over nor under. and um, and you keep the ordinary Reitermeister moves and you add what look like another little collection of Reitermeister moves. That's one way to say it. That is, I have a flat one, uh, I have a flat two and a flat three. It doesn't matter. There's no crossing over or under here. And then I have a kind of Reitermeister three that says that virtual crossing, consecutive virtual crossing arc can move across an ordinary classical arc like that, or classical crossing like that. Um, however, this entire little collection can be summarized by saying that we allow the detour move. And a detour move is a, is a consecutive sequence of virtual crossings, which you can cut out and reroute anywhere else. So in this point of view, the the addition of the virtual crossings is an addition of um, the possibility of connecting one point with another uh, with uh, an innocuous line, which is neither over nor under and can be reconnected anywhere else. So that when you see this, it really means this point is connected to this point. Um, and if you think for a few minutes, you will see that this one detour move implies all of these and conversely having all of these implies the detour move by doing them successively in the right way so um so that's one way of thinking about what virtual knob theory is it's adding uh, the possibility of connecting something so that what you had drawn which was in fact not planar uh will be represented in the plane and in that sense, it's a move that graph theorists use all the time when they draw graphs that are not planar, but put them in the plane by an immersion diagram, where these would be the immersion crossings. On the other hand, we like to interpret this system by saying that what is really going on is that the knot is on some surface. So for example, you can do that immediately by saying that at every virtual crossing, you will put a handle on the plane and you will route one of them up through the handle uh, like that. And uh, then the knot is actually a knot diagram drawn on a surface or a knot or link in a thickened surface, which is equivalent. I'll, I'll say more about that in a moment, but the following moves must be indicated as being forbidden uh, uh, for this theory. Uh, we don't allow uh, a, a standard sequence of Stop. classical crossings. People should move, re, remove their microphone from action. Uh, we don't allow either of these apparently uh, uh, attractive moves. On the other hand, if you allow both of them, you'll find that you can unknot things, a result due to Sam Nelson and the Kamadas. And if you allow only one of them, you arrive at a theory which preceded virtual knot theory called welded uh, braids and welded knots due to Rourke, Fenn, and Rimiani. And they were working mostly with braids and they have this extra kind of move and a virtual type crossing. So in the welded theory, the virtual crossing is welded to the plane. You can't go under it, but you can go over it. Uh, and welded knot theory is very interesting in its own right. Uh, and maybe in the course we will run into welded knots. Getting back to virtual knots, um, another way to lift to a surface, which is better, more canonical, uh, is 
to start with the diagram and form on now notice by the way uh what i said was that these are just connectors but then you could in fact uh think of the data for a virtual knot then as the data at the crossings and lines which connect the, cro the, the crossings to each other including virtual lines like that so i didn't write it down but another way of talking about the data for the virtual knot would be to write just these crossings and labels for their ends saying, for example, that this is A, this is B, C and D, and this B would be connected to the label over here. In that case, the combinatorial data, it depends on the cyclic order of this little platelet that constitutes the crossing. That's one way, that's one way to understand combinatorially what you're talking about. Another is the Gauss code. In the Gauss code, you just run a Gauss code just like you usually do, walking along the knot and putting down data over one and it's a positive crossing, under two, it's a, it's a positive crossing, back under one and over two. And in that case, you have the Gauss code, but uh, if you, and, and that's uh, a nice combinatorial entity and you don't write down the virtual crossings at all, but you find that when you try to realize the Gauss code by making a drawing, you find that you need it to, to have virtual crossings to live in the plane. It's really the Gauss code of something that's drawn in a higher genus. How do you get to the higher genus? Well, that's what I started to say a moment ago. My favorite method is the abstract knot diagram, which also is due to the Kamadas. Uh, and the abstract knot diagram is obtained by forming a disk neighborhood of each crossing and then adding bands from each disk to the next disk and those bands don't care about the virtual crossings at all so the band that connects this guy to this guy just goes under and this one goes over but they're really independent of one another in the drawing i make them under and over and you can think about embedded abstract knot diagrams if you like but for the purpose of virtual crossing uh you know, i could have drawn this the other way so that means that at a at a virtual crossing you write a uh, a ramp and another ramp independently at each ordinary classical crossing you make a little disk neighborhood and you put it all together and form this ribbon graph or ribbon surface like that then it has some boundary components and to each boundary component add a disk for efficiency and you get a least genus surface on which the knot sits for that diagram uh, on the other hand uh, you can go from uh, a uh, knot in a in a, in a surface, a knot diagram in a surface, by projection, if you get the projection just right, as Roger was saying last time, or you can do the same process that I mentioned. That is, you take the diagram in the surface, you form a neighborhood in the surface. Now you cut it out. You now have some uh, ribbon graph with some twisting in it because of the way you're looking at it, but the twisting is irrelevant because you're thinking of it abstractly. So you take that ribbon graph and you remove the twisting and write it in a nice flat way so that the normal vectors are all pointing in the same direction and project it into the plane, you get a diagram, a virtual diagram. So you see, you can go back and forth between virtual diagrams and diagrams in surfaces by this method but this method of going back and forth ignores any genus in the surface that isn't hugging the knot uh, and a genus that is forced in to be preserved by the neighborhood construction so there could have been another handle out here and if you were to have cut it out and then re-embedded it into a surface by adding disks you would have ignored the other handles so the surgery process that roger mentioned last time can be re reworded in diagrammatically in this way that you're allowed to cut it cut out the neighborhood and re-embed you can re-embed in a higher genus surface or you can re-embed in the least genus surface that you can make um, and you take 
the knots at the level of knots diagrams in surfaces or knots in thickened surfaces up to cut and re-embed. And that means that uh, you have a, a rougher equivalence relation than just looking at knots in a given surface. Um, but that rougher equivalence relation turns out to be equivalent to the diagrammatic version of virtual knot theory that I started with a few minutes ago. So the diagrammatic virtual knot theory is the same as knots in thickened surfaces or knot diagrams in surfaces taken up to handle stabilization in the way that I mentioned. Uh, the variations uh, on virtual knot theory, it's worth mentioning that uh, the welded knot variation, as I said, uh, and it's also worth mentioning, and we may go into it in more detail, a nice construction that began with Shinsato of taking a welded knot and mapping it into uh, a torus that is embedded in force space. I think I will not go into that. As I said, I'm just doing a little sketch about virtual knot theory and we'll be coming back to it. Um, then uh, one more thing that's worth mentioning in this quick sketch is the bracket polynomial extends to virtuals in the easiest possible way. You just do it again. Uh, where the loops that you encounter may have virtual crossings in them in the diagram, but you evaluate all the loops this way. There are more refined ways to handle this extension, and we'll talk about that. And then as a parting shot, here's a nice example. Um, it's an example of making the Gauss code, but it's an example for you to calculate the bracket polynomial. Um, if you have never seen this before. You should calculate the bracket polynomial of this ostensibly non-trivial virtual knot, and it is non-trivial. And you'll find that it has trivial bracket polynomial. So the age-old problem of are there any knots with unit Jones polynomial, which is very hard for classical knots and no one knows an answer to it, uh, uh, the virtual knot theory is replete with examples of non-trivial virtual knots with unit Jones polynomial, of which this is probably the simplest one. And this has been obtained from the trefoil knot by a process that we sometimes call virtualization, which is to, uh, instead of going this way and underneath and coming over here, which would be a trefoil knot, I went through virtually and back under and then through virtually. That has the effect of switching the sign of this crossing. Roger suggests that if you take the knots up to allowing yourself to do that, we could call them swap knots because we swapped the crossing. Not a bad idea to call them swap knots. So that would be knots taken up to uh, being allowed to do this. Uh, but in any case, if you swap a crossing in this way uh, on, a, on a classical knot, you, um, you will, in the case of the trefoil, you will find that you get a knot with unit Jones polynomial. And I'll let you, if you haven't seen this before, I think <coughs> it's a nice exploration for you to explore this and find out what swapping does. Uh, and then we can talk about it uh, at another point. So that's a quick remark about virtual knot theory questions before I go back to what I was talking about. Okay. We were uh, somewhere in this region. And I wanted to go back over this with a little more detail and maybe just repeating it helps because the ideas are simple. There's some technicality that I'm avoiding and there's some technicality that I'm avoiding because nobody knows how to do it, namely the full functional integral. 
but the holonomy uh, is interesting to think about. Now, when I do it this way, you get a better picture, but I can't point. Uh, I, I don't think I have any way to point, no. Uh, so I'll talk to the image. You have a knot, and you imagine dividing it up into, partitioning it up into a sequence of points. And then at a given point on the knot, um, you can uh, consider the operator one plus a of x. And you can think of that as an operator that shifts you from, uh, from, uh, from a vector v to the vector v plus a of x times v. You can think of that as the parallel translation operator a of x, um, which allows you to take a vector which is at a given point on the knot. And that vector is, in, a, in, in our case, in, in the fiber of a trivial fiber bundle over three space. So it can be any dimension you like. Um, and it's the dimension on which the matrix A of X acts. Remember that A of X is a one form, a matrix valued one form. So think of it as just a matrix and it acts on the vector. Um, so if I take a vector and I apply one plus A of X, I shift it over to the next X. And then at the next x, I apply 1 plus a of x prime, the next x, and do it again, and keep applying that and, and shifting the vector all the way around the knot until it comes back to where it started. Um, and that, uh, that operation is what I've called here um, uh, a clumsily, the product over x belonging to k of 1 plus a of x, and um, written it out. Uh, that operator, and then I take the trace of that operator. And uh, that gives me a measure of what parallel translation around the knot does to a vector. And is TA that, a tangent or something? I'm sorry? It, what, what's TA? TA is some basis of a collection of matrices that you've chosen beforehand. So you have chosen a collection of matrices. They might be poly matrices, for example. Uh, I'll give you an example of some matrices in a lower slide. Let me give you an example right now, just for the sake of of making it concrete, what I have in mind. But uh, the, the example is farther below. How uh, farther below? There. All right. So, for example, the TAs, sorry, sometimes up, sometimes down. Um, I may take a, a collection of matrices like these lambdas. So that's an example of a set of TAs. Um, they form the basis for the Lie algebra for SU3. That means that they are, as you see, they are Hermitian. Um, and they um, are closed under commutators. If you try it out, you will find that lambda one, lambda two, minus lambda two, lambda one, is going to be some combination of those uh, matrices. And you get to, you get to, uh, the, you get to the matrices for SU3 by exponentiating them. That is, you take e to the i times one of these, and you will get um, an element of a group, and that group is SU3. So this is the Lie algebra of SU3 that I'm looking at here. And the gauge connection is given by specifying the Lie algebra of some gauge group. In this case, it could have been SU3. All right. So, um, so you could take this as a nice example. And it is a nice example. But let's go back for now here. The, the, the gauge connection, the A of X, is written out explicitly as for each K, this is a sum of coefficients times elements in the Lie algebra. So this is just an arbitrary element in the Lie algebra, a linear combination of its basis elements. That's what this is. I could call that A upper A of X, right? Um, and um, 
but I've indicated that this curve, this index, because there's one for each space direction. So it's a matrix valued one form. And it is acting not on tangent vectors to the knot, but on vectors in an arbitrary internal space, an arbitrary, so you have a, a, a you have uh, the cross product of the internal vector space on which the Lie algebra is acting and the three dimensional space. So you're just watching this parallel translation formulated that way on these higher dimensional possibly vectors here. Uh, Lou, you have uh, two indices A there. So are you summing over all A? Whenever I have a repeated index, I'm summing. That's correct. So this represents a sum over A upper A of X, TA, and is therefore, other than the fact that we've specified to K and we're talking about X, this is just a coefficient and we're summing over coefficients times TA. So it's an arbitrary element in the algebra of matrices generated by the TAs. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, and and um, and then as I said, you can think of the operator one plus this as a way of telling you how to shift from a, a given point x to a nearby point, right? So that this is the connection. If you think of a connection as uh, an instruction to shift, we also made some other notations. One of them was a little triangle with a with an upline in it, and that uh, is to be dxk. And then uh, the other thing that I'm doing here all the time is using diagrammatic connection of lines to indicate uh, a summation on index. So we did that in the state sums before, and we're doing it now. So if I have an index like this and another one here, then I would draw a line out of this one that would connect over to that one. And that means that I'm summing on that index. It'll happen in a diagram soon enough, so I won't draw, try to draw here. Um, and then the other thing that we talked about, oh, and here's a Lie algebra element. Uh, and the Lie algebra element is a matrix. So it has an input line and an output line. It's TA in the ij place, and this is the ith place and the j place, but it's ta. So I have drawn it as a box with an index on it, that's the a, this, this is the index box, index indicator, and this is the matrix indicator, which would allow it to be thought of as a morphism from one object to another, or as an ij index of the matrix itself. Now, the other thing that we did was we formally differentiated the Wilson loop. Formally differentiating the Wilson loop means that I think of A upper A sub K of X as a variable. It itself is a variable. That means infinitely many variables. We're doing functional differentiation. One variable for every space point X. And a discrete set of indices makes it that many more variables. But if I differentiate with respect to this, it means formally that I knock it out and get its coefficient just in the one place because it's a different variable in the nearby axis. All right. You use a direct delta function and you take certain limits to make sense out of this, but we're just going to do it formally. So I take that out. If I take that out, then in the product that this is, this is a product of these matrices, in that product, it'll go along as it did before, right up to that point X. And then instead of having this at that point, it just has this. Sorry. It just has this. So this alone is sitting at that point in the line. And then it goes on doing whatever it did uh, all along forevermore for there. So you walk along the line and suddenly you bump into a matrix that's sitting on the line. And there's a DXK and there's a TA. 
and this is happening at the point x. So, uh, so I indicate that by insertion, by putting an arrow saying it's inserted, or I indicate it with a diagram with a matrix inserted into the diagram. And I have another notation, which is, dip, uh, this is of course, functionally differentiating with respect to this variable. So it's written as D of this, D that. But instead of writing it that way, I'm going to abbreviate it by a D, a stylized D with an upper index A and a lower index K. And it's uh, given that it's differentiating with respect to the X as well. So I would write D upper A sub K of W is W with this insertion. So those were notations that I introduced before. And by now you probably have memorized them. So then this uh, a slide I'm, I'm not quite proud of. I'm going to do it again. But, but the point is I wanted to show you uh, what, uh, what it looks like if you lift the hood and actually go through parallel translation around a small loop. You've probably done exercises like this before in studying differential geometry, and it's it's exactly the same. And um, the only the, what I'm not proud about in this slide is that I wrote it in the exponential form, giving myself extra work. And I could have written it, and I will when I do it uh, when I rewrite this slideshow. I could have done it entirely with the infinitesimal translation this way, and it would have been simpler. But the Let's think about it this way. So we're going to go all the way around the loop, which means that I go this way, and then I go this way. So I broke it up into the two pieces. And the first one is to translate by to x plus dx, and then to translate from x plus dx to x plus dx plus delta x over here, and then to go back around. So the first one is to multiply by e to the a, and then multiply by e to the a at x plus dx. Now, what does it mean to multiply by e to the a? Well, there it is. And then I have a uh, delta x at x plus dx. This is important. This is expanded by Taylor series, right? But you're, you can truncate. So you get the, 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 you get this and you get its derivative in the mu in the, in a certain direction and I might have made a mistake there. Uh, like I said, I'm not happy with this slide, but you certainly are differentiating it. So don't try to read the indices. It's just that when you expand this, you get a derivative, right? And then the product of two exponentials involves a commutator, exponentiated matrices involves a commutator at the next level, dx, the product of the dx's. That's a formula for exponentiating matrices. So you get, you get that. And then you get another one going back around. Please mute your mic. And when you add all that up, you find that what you're getting when you go all the way around is the mu partial of a nu minus the new partial of a mu plus the commutator of a mu a nu times dx mu dx nu. That's what happens when you go all the way around the loop. So that's the, par that's the result of parallel translating around a loop. And that, which I've written as e to the f mu nu dx mu dx nu, that f mu nu is by definition the curvature at that point of the connection of the gauge field. And this turns out for physicists to represent the actual physical field. So if you had started with the simplest gauge group, you would end up with electromagnetism. In the simplest gauge group, there are no commutators. You're abelian and you get uh, this. And this is a familiar formula in physics for going from the potential uh, function to the uh, electromagnetic field. So what, what Yang and Mills understood was that if they had generalized fields uh, to Lie algebras and thought of them as geometric connections in sort of the potential functions as geometric connections 
lying in back of the physics then by taking the curvature by taking these little circulations around points they picked up the physical fields themselves in a generalized form that involved commutators uh, uh, that would be expressed in terms of the Lie algebra. So that's what's going on under the hood there. Uh, and then uh, the other the mathematical nicety is that if you take the A uh, and you take DA plus A wedge A and think of these as differential forms, so they anti-commute Grossman algebra on the DXIs, then you arrive at this immediately, of course. It's just differentiation formalism. You get derivative of the A's and you get uh, products of A's with themselves. And because it's differential forms, you can put this in standard order and then you get a commutator here and you get a difference there and there's the curvature term. So algebra produces that immediately you have to watch a little more carefully to do the parallel translation. Um, then the next thing you, that one needs, if one is going to go under the hood here and look at it, is you have to put in the Lie algebra that's involved. So I just thought I'd show you that a little bit. So here's some Lie algebra, and it has kind of, it has its coefficients that tell you how to combine. The structure coefficients in the Lie algebra tell you that if you take the commutator of TA with TB, you get the sum over C of FABCTC for certain coefficients. So then we have the F mu nu, which is given abstractly like this, derivative of this minus the derivative of that and the commutator. And you put in for each of these what they are. And these are matrices. They're not functions of anything. Uh, and you have matrices here. And you're summing over them. So it just resolves itself back out with a few more indices into this guy times a matrix and a product of coefficients times a commutator of the matrices. Ah, commutator of the matrices. So this commutator turns into a commutator of these matrices. And that becomes, that brings the matrices back in view with the structure coefficient. So there it is. And then you can collect terms. And so you can say that the, the, uh, the basic thing uh, for the curvature is going to be a certain set of specific coefficients times the Lie algebra matrices. And those coefficients are these derivatives plus the coefficients times the structure constants in the Lie algebra. So you get uh, a very specific uh, formula for the curvature of the gauge field. And, and that curvature um, is, according to what we worked out, going to be the way the Wilson loop evaluation will vary when you change the knot a little bit. If you change the knot a little bit by a little loop that started, you started the knot here, you wandered around by a little loop and came back uh, and changed the knot by a little deformation like that, then the evaluation of the of the Wilson loop is going to change by a curvature and that will in fact be changing by coefficients like this. So there are these specific numerical coefficients that look like that, curvature coefficients. And then what will happen is that you you do the holonomy around a little loop and you pick up the curvature times dx dx. That's what happens. You get curvature times Lie algebra times a little bit of area. And so it looks like this. And so if you, uh, if you were to um, look at uh, the holonomy around somebody where you deformed it a little bit, you would get the ordinary one. And you would get the one where there was this inserted into the Wilson loop. So that means that you are inserting this Lie algebra. You take the difference and the one goes away. So you just have this bit of Lie algebra inserted into the loop. So, the, so that's why I said that if you deform it a little bit, what happens is that the Lie algebra matrix finds itself stuck in the loop and, and then summed over curvature coefficients 
and an area like that. So we know that as well. So we know two things. We know that, uh, that if you vary the loop, then uh, that corresponds to this specific sort of modification of the evaluation of the loop. And we know how to differentiate the loop with respect to the gauge field. And so we know enough to uh, get a picture of how things work. There is one further thing that we need to know, but I haven't written a derivation of it. I think I'll just give you a reference for this from Knots in Physics or another paper. Uh, it's a calculation you have to do. You take that Trin Simons Lagrangian, which we wrote down earlier, another differential form, a three form that's integrated over the space, and you ask, how does it behave if I if I vary the field, and you find out that it behaves with regard to curvature this way, that if you tie it into an epsilon, which is a sign change or index permuter, it's, you know, this is equal to one if RSI is a standard cyclic order sign one permutation of RS and I. It's minus one if it's a negative sign permutation and it's zero if any two of these are equal. So that means that an index one gets transformed into the indices two and three and vice versa. You've seen this pattern before in vector cross products. Anyway, if you do that to the derivative of L with respect to the A, you get the curvature tensor. So the curvature tensor appears as this formula, that the, the, der it, the curvature tensor itself is equal to the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to uh, the gauge field. And Lou, yeah, can you can you remind me what a Wilson loop is? Yeah, I use the term Wilson loop. That's this. Or Wilson the Wilson loop. The Wilson loop is the trace of the evaluation of the holonomy around the loop. Okay, so that so. Okay. So remember that while, while there's no way to avoid having a certain number of indices, uh, which I've, uh, instead of hiding, put forward as part of the notation, uh, the idea is very simple. The idea is that we set it up so that it looks like differential geometry, but we are, we're doing a geometry of parallel translation in a fiber bundle, which is, what we're doing, but it's a trivial fiber bundle. And we're parallel translating uh, the vectors in that fiber bundle all the way around until we come back. Those vectors um, are being acted on by the gauge connection. I mean, and so we-, we vary, I mean, if you, if you vary, you know, it's a knot, isn't it? If you, you know, move the knot around a bit, but does that alter W? Yes, it does. That's what I was saying. I'm glad you're asking this now because it's exactly what I was just saying. Um, where's the slide? Here it is. The question is, what happens if you change the knot a little bit, right? If you change the knot a little bit and what you're doing is parallel translating a vector to see how to measure the knot, then as you parallel translated your vector, you, you got involved in, oops, going around a little very tight loop and then continuing on. And going around a little tight loop in your parallel translation picks up curvature. Going around a little tight loop picks up curvature. Um, and that curvature involves, is a little complicated in this situation, not the curvature from, uh, from the usual differential geometry course that you might have taught or taken. There are matrices involved. It's, uh, you're measuring the curvature in this fiber bundle situation where you have matrices acting on the fibers. So you get a curvature tensor and a matrix involving a matrix. Um, and, and so what happens to this is that you get the usual one plus an evaluation where you inserted a matrix and the curvature tensor into the Wilson line. Inserting into the Wilson line means you evaluate this the way you did before but then at the point when you meet this, you put in that matrix and then you keep on going. Does that answer your question? Uh, sort of. 
but of course you know the you can vary the the, the knot by more than just putting in a little loop you can do also well of course but that means that it could be your variation of the knot can be done as a composition of small variations of that kind is that right okay and uh, and if you did a much larger variation, then you would be integrating over things like this. Okay. But if if but if you could if you could make it happen that a tiny like like Reitermeister's triangle moves. Remember Reitermeister's triangle moves proving yeah. the Reitermeister moves. You would factor a Reitermeister move or any other move in space of the knot into little moves across tiny triangles, and you can make them as small as you like, and then do a large number of them to create the, the isotopy that you had in mind. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Um, so, as I was saying, it's a very geometrical idea uh, that you would that you would parallel translate around the knot and measure the knot that way but unfortunately it it's not invariant uh it depends on the choice of connection so uh so then you might say well okay why don't we just integrate it over all the connections and that's what Witten did except that he realized realizes that he, he needs a weighting factor in order to make his integral uh, invariant under isotopy. So um, what did that look like? Um, I'll, I'll get us over to that formalism again. This is Witten's integral, where L is, um, I didn't even write down the formula for L recently, and I won't, right? The only thing I'm asking you to remember about L, which is Witten's weighting factor, is that it it has the property that if you watch how it varies with respect to the gauge connection, it also gives you curvature. So it gives you curvature outside of varying the geometry of something. It just gives you the curvature because it in some way is an integral of the curvature. It's just sitting there, a, a quantity which when you look at how it varies with respect to the field, hands you the curvature, right? And that's the weighting factor. And then what we're seeing in this, in this nuts and bolts calculation is that when you vary the knot a little bit, which is what this meant, and varying the knot a little bit, the difference was the same as inserting curvature into the line like that. And then we go through the rest of this calculation and find that the weighting factor interacts with this in such a way that it will, under the right circumstances, as an integral, as an integrated thing, be invariant under this deformation. So it balances out. And how does it manage to balance out? Well, that's interesting. Um, the curvature is the derivative of this Lagrangian. So we can put that in. And then we can put that derivative that got it on the weighting factor. So I'm now differentiating the e to the i k over 4 pi l. I'll differentiate it. Um, and um, having differentiated it, um, oh, yeah, um, I have to take the coefficient of it um, and invert it and put it there because I didn't have it here, right? So once you differentiate that, the coefficient will come down and knock that out. Okay, so I have now I'm differentiating this function. This is written as the product of two functions, the weighting factor and the Wilson loop. So I integrate by parts. Integrating by parts puts the derivative back over on the Wilson loop and changes a sign over here. It is assumed that integration by parts works. That is, a a, a prime B plus A B prime integrated is going to be equal to the derivative, integral of the derivative of something, and the boundary conditions are canceling the integral of that derivative. We're assuming that things work that way. So I can just integrate by parts, just means 
that I can exchange derivative on one function to derivative on the other function. And now I'm differentiating the Wilson loop again. And we know that differentiating the Wilson loop causes another causes an Lie algebra and a DX insertion into the Wilson loop somewhere. And if you look closely and see what happened to the indices, you find out that the index on this bit, bit of Lie algebra is connected to the index on the other bit of Lie algebra. So you have bit of Lie algebra connected to bit of Lie algebra summed on the basis of the Lie algebra. And the dx goes into the epsilon. And this is a volume form. This is the determinant of those dxi directions. So that's the result of this formal calculation. It says that this function here is up to derivatives equivalent to this function here. As far as integration is concerned, this function and this function look the same. And this one is showing you that if, if the deformation involved did not involve three dimensions of change, then this volume form shuts down and this variation will be zero. So that's the variational argument that, for example, if you constrained the motion of the knot to be in a plane and you were just doing Reitermeister 2 or Reitermeister 3, then the, then the change would be only involving two out of three spatial directions and this would vanish. And so the resulting thing is going to be a fra an invariant of framed lengths. That's what this variational argument is telling you. So this is a way of understanding in this formalism how it is that, the, that a weighting factor of this kind could balance the way the Wilson loop changes when, you, uh, when the curvature comes in, and that by formally integrating over all of the connections in this way, you could get something which is a knot invariant. Uh, if you're interested in seeing some other points of view about this, I recommend, and I'll put that information into the Dropbox, um, I recommend looking at Witten's original paper and also a Tia's book, which is called The Geometry and Topology of Knots, a Tia's little book. Um, I think that's what it's called. And you will see different points of view. This is a very nuts and bolts elementary point of view that I'm showing you. Uh, Witten's point of view is much higher level, but I don't know how to justify it um, in a similar way. Um, you could read Witten's paper and ask yourself, how does he know that he's getting a framed invariant of links when he writes these expressions down? Ask yourself, how does he know? Maybe, maybe you can understand it in a way that I don't. Okay, so, so that's the summary. Um, and um, now let's go on for a few minutes. Um, the Lie algebra, as I say, could be made quite concrete like this. And then it, it turns out that uh, uh, if you use some specific bases like the ones here, and I'm going to skip a slide, you can get some very cute identities, algebraic identities. And people who study Vassiliev invariants use these same identities when you're talking about these classical groups. For example, I, I'll skip that slide. You can get this identity um, for, per, for the SUN type situation. You can get that the insertion of of the Lie algebra, just like we were talking about, into two lines like this. Uh, and then these are the matrix elements. So this just represents the product of these two matrix elements summed over A. And this is, as you see, T upper A sub alpha beta. And this is T upper A sub gamma delta, okay? And this is just the sum of the products of them. And it's the sort of thing that came up when we looked at doing that Lie algebra insertion into the functional integral. 
Um, so it would be nice to have a, a cuter formula for it. And, and this is a very cute formula for it um, in this SUN case. It turns out that it's equal to one half of Kronecker delta on alpha beta, Kronecker delta on alpha delta, and crossed Kronecker deltas with another term. And uh, that's a bit of algebra calculation about this, this matrix formula. So that means that if you saw this somewhere, you could substitute for it smoothing this and putting a crossing in like that, a crossing that's neither over nor under. That's called a fierce identity for the SUN Lie algebra. So that turns out when, when you do weight systems for Vassiliev invariance to be important for understanding things. And it turns out to be important here for the same reason. So then you can do some little calculations and see why you're, why at this nuts and bolts level, this is picking up the Humphrey polynomial. One thing you need to know is what happens under framing. And under framing, ah, I think there's something I didn't, uh, remind you about from last time. We'll go back to this. Oh, I see. I skipped it over to the other end of things. No, there. No? Okay, no matter. Um, this was the end summary of our calculation, right? And then you have to ask, sorry, I'm backing up, but you have to ask, well, what would happen if I did a deformation that switched the crossing, right? What will happen? And I started to tell you about that last time. But what happened to it? That's my question, sorry. There it is. Okay. So then I'm claiming that this is what happens. And I think I will just postpone to next time since we're running out of time or repeating, but I'll repeat with a little more geometry drawn why this works. But the, here, here is Lie algebra being inserted twice. Yes, there it is being inserted twice. But you could ask, well, why, why did you choose to insert it that way? One in one line and one in the other. And the answer is that one line is varying geometrically, being pushed up and down. So that creates two dimensions of variation of space. But you need three in order for the volume form to turn on. And the third direction has to do with differentiating in the direction of the other line at the point where they just touch one another. So you end up with an insertion like that. Now, since we're, um, so, so that's why I say I'm interested in this kind of an insertion, okay? I'm interested in this kind of insertion because it comes up in thinking about what happens when you switch a crossing. With that in mind, and just believing it for a moment, we can go on to what I was saying. Which was that, you see, if I have a, a little curl uh, and I look at this difference, then I will get a double insertion of Lie algebra into the line. And then you're in a position, you see, to figure out what happened to the framing, because you can, you can put in for the double Lie algebra insertion, you can put in the fears, what the fears identity tells you and figure out the framing factor. Uh, and I, I'm, since we're near the end of time, I'm not going to do this in detail. We can walk back and look at it more carefully, but then you have the fears identity and you want to look at what happens here and you do the same thing. This minus this is, is given by the fears identity inserted in here. And then you, you rewrite it and you find that you have a factor times the plus crossing and another factor times the minus crossing. And 
you might wonder, well, what, what is he doing with the one that's crossed over and not one or the other? And that can be regarded as the average of over and under. So this is a heuristic calculation. But what you end up with is the Humphrey identity. So you can see heuristically how the Humphrey skein identity is coming out of this situation. Now, I'm still in the form of sketching, but let me sketch forward. Um, and so we get uh, some completion here. The point is that this exact same pattern comes to you in a way that looks like straight combinatorial topology if you start from the notion of the finite type facility of invariant. So let's just look at this up to that point and then we'll quit. The, the story, which you are, I'm sure already know, but let's say it again, is that you look for uh, a skein relation uh, of a general type. You want that the value of the invariant V on this minus the value of the invariant V on this should be equal to the invariant on some graph node. So you have an embedded graph uh, like this, a knotted graph embedded in space. And, um, and then the question is, uh, what relations uh, about the graphs embedded graphs are necessary from the point of view of the Reitermeister rules. Um, and sorry, and and this, which goes back, you can check for me the source of this derivation. Is it Ted Stanford? Um, it's of course implicit in what Vasiliev did, but the, this is a very nice derivation, just starting from what I said, that I want an identity that says that if I switch, then I get the graphical node. Um, and I have an invariant of graphs. And I know that if I have slipped uh, a, um, uh, a line underneath, then I can pull it out and push it over onto the top. OK. But then on the, I also have the switching identity, which says that I can take this crossing and switch it up. And I take the difference, and I get a node. And then I can take this crossing and switch it up and take the difference and I get a node and down the line for four, for four equations and add them up and they all add up to zero because the end equation is topologically equal to the first equation. Nothing more than the definition of having an invariant by taking a difference to get an invariant of graphs. And you get that this fourth term relation must be satisfied. This relation for graphs with double nodes. And the relation is that along one direction, you have two nodes, and then you have them permuted. And then along the other direction, you have two nodes, and you have them permuted. You could write it as an equation where along one direction, you have two nodes and permuted. And along the other direction, you have two nodes and permuted. And that must be satisfied in an embedded way but it can also be looked at abstractly. And if you put the finite type uh, restriction on the invariant, then you get a level, we'll talk about it in more detail, at which the abstract one is the one you're interested in. And what is the nature of this abstract relation? And the nature of that is Lie algebraic. This story doesn't involve the gauge theory machinery, it just involves asking, or a topological invariant that has this kind of differencing. Because if you're looking at a Lie algebra diagrammatically, the way I just did, then TA, TB minus TB, TA, you can switch these lines, is equal to structure constant times TC. And that diagrammatically says two lines minus two permuted lines gives you a trivalent vertex sitting in there. So then you start with the same thing I just got out of topology, and you take this minus this permuted is equal to structure constant. And then if your structure constant algebra was sufficiently good, you could deform this and just push it over there. And then you could expand it again, and you would find you would prove the four-term relation from the Lie algebra relation. So that this tells you that 
the structure of Lie algebras is intimately related to the structure of non-invariants. Bang, with nothing other than this footprint and very little machinery, no machinery, just Reitermeister moves and this idea, the Vasiliev idea. But that is all, as you see, uh, directly in line with what's happening in Witten's integral, where uh, the Lie algebra insertions are being asked for when you take this kind of differencing. So that means that this abstract fundamental notion of the Lie algebras being related to the not invariants, which is the part that, that I think we appreciate most because it's so uh, completely clear and there isn't any worry about differential geometry or anything. Um, it is related to this geometry uh, and we can tell a more complete story about how such invariants can emerge by looking more carefully at the Witten geometry. So I'll keep on with that uh, for a while, maybe one more lecture, and then switch to virtual knots or something else. Okay. Oh, thanks, Lou. Uh, are there questions? Um, I have a question, Lou. In uh, Witten's integral, he used the Chern Simons form. Can you that's the that's that the uh, that's the L, yeah. What I wrote is L. I see, and that's something. It its derivative is related to the curvature. Then is that correct? Yeah, that's right. That's right. Uh-huh. So there's a, there's a history of that. Maybe I could do a little background for you about the history of that. But there is a history of, of why people were studying the Chern Simons form that of course Witten knew. I mean Wit Witten knew a lot to be able to put all this together in the right way. I think we'd appreciate that. Okay, well, um, are there any more questions? Oddly enough, I'm gonna talk about um, virtual knots myself on Friday. <laughs> but Soon we'll uh, both be talking about virtual knots. But yeah, but slightly, I, I mean, I have my reasons, <laughs> as I'm sure you have as well. Okay, so I will uh, wish you all good night or good morning or whatever, and we'll finish now. Okay. <laughs>